We all know the stories, the ones of people quitting their soul-sucking jobs and starting the entrepreneurial dream. My friend Goalie is one of those people, leaving behind her law career and starting a whole new business, one that she wasn't really sure would work. She chronicles her story and others in her popular podcast, Lessons from a Quitter. Goalie is now a business coach for others who want to quit their jobs and find their true passion. I sat down to chat with Goalie about how she did it. What did she do first? Where did she start? How did she grow her audience? And how can others find their true calling? If you're feeling drained by your nine to five gig, you want to figure out what actually makes you happy and you're looking for a way out. This is a must listen episode. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Passive Project Podcast, where we talk about how to build your online business to make more income, more impact, and give you more freedom in your life. I'm Gemma Bonham Carter, business strategist, mom of two, lover of passive income, automation, and coffee. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, hey guys, welcome to this episode. I am really excited because on today's show, we have Goalie from Lessons from a Quitter. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited too. So I was on Lessons from a Quitter just recently. So we are doing like a bit of a podcast swap, which is really fun. Uh, getting on each other's shows, which I love. I'm really excited for you to share your story on the Passive Project podcast because I think it's a story that a lot of people are able to resonate with. And um, I'm excited to chat about kind of your journey into entrepreneurship and how you've gotten to where you are today. So do you want to introduce yourself and let people know what you do? And then we can like dive into the backstory a little bit. Yeah, sure. For sure. That sounds great. So I um, started out actually in my career, I was a lawyer. I spent my whole life kind of going to school and doing that traditional path. And I went to undergrad and then law school. I practiced law for about eight years. Um, I was unhappy for the majority of those years. <laughs> and um, when I had my son in 2014, I just kind of had one of those, you know, moments where I had to really reevaluate my life. And, and you know, I, it, kind of in hindsight and doing this in a short interview, it sounds like, you know, I made the decision to quit. That really took me about a year to mm-hmm. really admit to myself before I even admitted to anybody else that I wanted to try something else. And, you know, I had all of the fears of what if this doesn't work? Am I going to throw all this away? Will I regret it? You know, and all the, and that's really the basis of my podcast lessons from a quitter. Like the reason I started it was because I went through so much mental anguish, like leaving something I knew I wanted to leave, but just wasn't appropriate by society standards. Like everyone thought I was crazy. So, um, anyways, a uh, long story short, I did quit in around 2015, and um, I started my entrepreneurial journey without knowing what I was doing. I started another company. Um, I manufacture and sell and rent photo booths, total random, like a side gig <laughs> that happened out of nowhere. And But that really got me kind of, it opened my mind more than anything to the fact that like, I really can do anything if I, yes. you know, everything is, you know, as Marie Forley says, figure outable, like you can yeah. Google pretty much anything. It's more getting over my own limiting beliefs of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do that. And once I figured that out, it, was, it kind of opened up a world to me. And then I stumbled onto this online, you know, entrepreneurial world. And that just completely shifted everything. So when you started your photo booth business, was that before you quit your, like being a lawyer? No. So technically, I I mean, I quit my job because when I had my son, I went on maternity leave and then we ended up moving states from Arizona back to California. And so I actually quit my job with all intentions of finding another legal job in California. But it was during that transition when I was at home with a newborn and I didn't have a job and I was like applying for jobs and feeling sick to my stomach with every application that I kind of started having these conversations with my husband and deciding, you know what, maybe I can try something else. And then through that process of me taking some time away, I started developing this product and then I ended up just going full force, making that product and not going back to law. I think so many people can relate to that happening at the time of having babies at home. Like yes. it is such a catalyst for, it, it It provides so much clarity on 
what you truly want your life to look like. And, you know, we're, I'm like, as much as I, I was never wanting to be a stay at home mom, yeah. but I wanted the freedom of like being able to des- design what my days and were going to look like. And I didn't want to have to put my kid into daycare right. or preschool or whatever, because mm-hmm. I had to go to a job that I hated. I wanted totally. to want to put my kid in like some yeah. awesome preschool <laughs> so that I could have some great hours to like work on my business or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, kids have a wonderful way of putting things in perspective for you. And I agree. I found myself very, and that's why a lot of the mental anguish, I found myself very much in the middle where like, I didn't want to be climbing this corporate ladder just so that I could say, you know, I made partner somewhere and like work a hundred hour weeks and make, you know, this a huge income, but not see my kids. But then at the same time, I knew I didn't want to be a stay at home mom. I mean, so much credit to them. Like I didn't have the patience. I was like, one of us isn't going to survive that. So I might as well (laughs) figure out like what I can do, but I wanted something in the middle. Like I wanted something where it's like, I want, I I kept thinking like, why can't I have, you know, it's not like have it all up quote unquote, but like, why can't I have the best of both worlds? Why can't I have something that intellectually stimulates me and gets me excited? But also clearly when I have children, I want to be able to spend time with them. Like I don't want to never see them. I felt uh, you were describing my situation perfectly. And I'm sure so many other people who are listening can resonate with that so hard too. So, um, okay. So you started your lessons from a quitter podcast. Why did you choose the podcast medium to sort of start growing this audience and this new business that way? Great question. You know, honestly, at that time, I didn't even really have a business idea. And I think this is like maybe a good reminder for a lot of people out there that are trying to think of things, you know, um, to do, let's say. Uh, I actually, because I know a lot of us suffer from imposter syndrome. And one way that I got around that for myself was like, well, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm just interviewing other people. I'm like a curator. I'm just like, I'm the middleman. I'm just going to show you examples of all these other people that have quit and have gone on to do amazing things so that you can see it's possible, you know? And so I think that kind of let me suppress my, my imposter syndrome enough to say like, okay, I, I can put this out in the world with, and I kept telling myself like, we're not, it's not like I'm offering coaching. It's not like I'm doing anything. I'm just like putting this out there. And so I really didn't have an idea. And I kept thinking like, I don't know how I'm going to monetize this, but like, I'm just going to start it because I was so passionate about the topic. Like I wanted to talk about this all the time. And I, every party I'd go to, everyone I would meet, I would like, it's amazing when you start talking about your thing, other people, like I'd be at parties talking to someone about their business. We'd be talking for like an hour. And then I'd say I was a lawyer and like, oh, I used to be a lawyer. And I'm like, wait, what? Well, you just left that whole part out that you left, you know? And so I really wanted to highlight that. And Mm -hmm. um, so I started, yeah, just, oh, and the reason I chose podcasting I listened to so many podcasts and it really is what shifted my mindset to let me quit. Like I listened to so many people um, that had done these amazing things. And then it was just more of a medium that I thought it was appropriate because I wanted longer interviews. Like my interviews are really around an hour because I think it takes so much time to get into the story and get into like the mindset stuff and the fear and how they got over like what their family was going to say and whatnot. And so I didn't want it to be a 10 minute video on YouTube. I didn't want it to be. So I was like, this is kind of the perfect place where I can have an in-depth conversation and I can, you know, put it out there for people that are kind of going through what I went through. It was something I wish I had, you know, I, I started in 2018. So it was like four years after I had left. And I thought like, I wish there was someone that, you know, when I would listen to these entrepreneurial podcasts, it was all people that were like, I've been an entrepreneur since I was seven. I've always been selling. I love like making money. And I'm like, I didn't feel like that. I was a great employee. I was a right. perfect employee, you know, and I was fine being an employee. So like, how do I show people that you can still be an entrepreneur if you don't feel like you have it in your DNA? Right. Or you're coming at this after 20 years yes. in a certain area or something. Yeah. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, you started the podcast and you, uh, like for the people out there who are in the same shoes in terms of like starting something brand new, from a tactical perspective, you started the podcast, you created a website, I assume, and like grabbed your, I don't know, your Instagram donate, like handle or something. And then just started building an audience totally organically. Is that what happened? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I had like no audience. Um, I started, I really just opened it up to my own personal audience, like, which, you know, at the time I was friends with a lot of lawyers because I went to law school with them and I went, you know, I worked in firms with them. So, you know, I got, people that were also unhappy. I knew a lot of people that were 
and happy in their careers. And so I st- it just started like that. And I got the Instagram and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, okay, I'm going to put this out and I'm going to try to grow my Instagram audience. And I started like that. I was listening to some like marketing podcasts. And so I was starting to think like, what do I need to do to grow this? I did, um, I, I don't want to say it wasn't early on, honestly. I think it was probably six months. I should have started much earlier, but I did start building my list slowly. Um, mm-hmm. I like put out one freebie and then I changed it. But I did, I was kind of playing around with how do I do this? Like, how do I get people onto my email list? But I didn't start like a newsletter for the first year. Like, I started getting people on, but I didn't know I was supposed to like send them stuff. I was like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to talk to you about. Like, I'm just going to put this on Instagram. So it was very much like just trial and error. I think I just let myself experiment and I didn't put too much pressure on myself. Like I had told myself when I was going to start it, and I know a lot of people don't have this luxury, um, but I told myself like, I'm going to not even worry about monetizing for the first year. I'm Mm -hmm. just going to like, I'm going to experiment. I'm going to put it out. I'm going to figure out podcasting and how to batch and how to get a schedule and all that stuff. I'm going to figure out list building. I'm going to grow my audience. I'm going to serve. And then I'll give myself like the pressure of, okay, how do we turn this into a business? And that's sort of what I did. Um, not to say I didn't think about monetizing that first year. I definitely did, but um, no, but you weren't coming from a place of yeah, like I a desperate. To be a yes. yes. And yeah. if, if that was, you know, the place that people are coming from in all likelihood, like the choosing the podcast is not the way to go, right? Like totally. you should be selling a service and just like totally. getting word of mouth referrals. And that's like a much faster way to like hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. I think podcasting is very good for depth. It's not mm-hmm. good for width. So like if you, it's a good medium to get people to know you and trust you and kind of know you more intimately. It's definitely not a lead generation type of a, a medium. You know, it's not like a social media type or a place where you're going to get constant leads. Um, so I think you have to kind of take that into consideration. And know. along, so how, at this time of recording, how yeah. long have you had your podcast? A little under two years. It'll be two years and we're in end of March. We're like beginning of April. Um, it's July. It'll be two years. And so. um, in that time, what sort of things did you notice in terms of like, were there themes or particular stories that resonated really well with people over other things that you tried? Were there like lessons learned in terms of how you molded the podcast to what it's become today? Um, yes. Of, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that... Um, Again, like I started thinking that people only wanted to hear the interviews. And so I would sprinkle in one like uh, episode of me talking about something, you know, and it was, I would do it on like a holiday because I thought people weren't going to be listening. And then I'd start getting all this feedback of like, I love that episode, like do more like that. And I was like, wait, what? Like, do you want to hear me? Why do you want my opinion? So that started getting me to do more like solo episodes and do things more of like they wanted more tactical advice and how do you like approach this issue and how do you do goal setting and how do you revise your resume and things like that. Um, so I definitely looked at that. I mean, I think I've evolved as an interviewer too. I would, like, I now look back at my original interviews and they're so long winded and I ramble so much, you know, now I realize like, okay, we got to get kind of to the meat of it. We got to get to like the part where people, you know, are really struggling. What's funny though is I've actually sort of learned the opposite is that like things that I think will resonate, you know, resonate with some people and then, you know, it's not like a hit. And then there's ones where I'm like, that wasn't that great of an interview. And then people will come back and be like, oh my God, that interview changed my life. And I'm like, wait, what? You know? And so I, I, it sort of shows me that like, we're all coming at this in different ways. And what's really interesting to me, what I've been, I've been uh, noticing that I, it's just, I still really fascinated is that. I know we all want to see ourselves. So I'll constantly get people say like, can you have a single mom on? Can you have a sole breadwinner on? Can you have someone that's over 60 that started? Can you have, because they want to see like, if somebody else did it, even though their situation is going to be different, like it's never your life, but they want to see themselves. And so it's like, I really do try to have like a wide range so that, because I think each one is going to resonate with a different person. You know, somebody who has a sp- like, you know, a spouse that can financially support them is not going to resonate with someone who wants to quit who's a sole breadwinner. And mm-hmm. so um, I think it's, it's interesting that like people, I, I really try to get a wide range so that people feel represented and can like see themselves in it. Yeah, no, I, I like that. Um, so with your, uh, have you found that the podcast mm-hmm has brought new people. So like what I use my podcast for is 
a connection point and going deep with my existing mm-hmm. audience. It's like a nurture piece of content yeah. that I love to give out for free and be able to teach and share stories and have people on that I want to highlight. However, I haven't really, like to your point, it's not that much of a lead gen strategy and I haven't used mine in that way, but I feel like yours has been, maybe yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but like, no, I feel has. like, yeah, like that's really been a big way that you've really grown your audience. So do you have any tips or strategies for people who might be trying to use their podcast in the same way and get it seen and more visible and attract a bigger audience to it? Yes. Um, I would say the the biggest tips are you have to get in front of them, right? So the best way to do that is to borrow other people's audiences. And so it's like going, especially for podcasting, I think it's important to be on other podcasts. Like you already know that they are podcast listeners. So it's not that hard for them to go over and listen to your podcast, right? And so um, I really try to align it with people's audience that I think will really resonate with my message. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I try to do other interviews so that people like find out about the podcast. I think that, um, this one's a little bit tougher, but, um, I think a lot of people that give a a lot of marketing advice are, you know, about niching down and stuff. The reason it's so important is that like my topic is a very specific topic and it's like a very specific problem that I'm addressing to people that are in, you know, um, established careers that are quote unquote successful by society standards, but, uh, but are unhappy. And the thing is, is like, in, in one sense, it's not that niche. It's not like just women, you know, in their thirties or whatnot, but in another sense, it's like a very specific problem. problem. So I have a lot of people that share it, you know? So I have a lot, because we all know somebody like that. So like, mm-hmm. I constantly have people be like, Oh, I give it, you know, I shared it with all my coworkers because we're all miserable or I share it, you know? And so I think I get a lot of people, um, that way in that people like organically share organically it because it sharing. really yeah really like hits home for them exactly it addresses a very specific problem and so i think a lot of people that are feeling really um lost in that space get super excited about it and so then they become like really loyal followers and like and that's how i kind of get more organic reach i would say though that's like my two biggest strategies and the second one is honestly a long game. Like I didn't realize this in the beginning and it was like just putting out consistent content, even in the beginning when I didn't think that was, there were that many people listening and I just mm-hmm. like saw it slowly snowball and become yes. more and more. And it's because people keep sharing it. And I think to your point about sharing it, uh, in my experience, although tactical um, sort of episodes, the five tips to, yeah, or the how mm-hmm. to do this in 30 days or whatever, uh, there's not the emotional reaction that yeah. come from storytelling or sharing a more vulnerable Absolutely. aspect of your business or personal life or whatever it might be. So those episodes that you're creating that are so compelling, it's much easier for people to want to hit that share button. Like exactly. when's the last time you sat and shared a how to, it almost right. never happens, right? right? We share inspirational, emotional type content Absolutely. much more easily. And I think we also... I mean, we all, that's how we all learn. We all crave stories. So I also think it's um, not easier, but I I can see that people come back week after week because they like hearing a story. Even if it's like, sometimes, honestly, after like the first year, I was like, should I, it's the same story. It's like literally the same fears. It's the same, like, I'm stuck. I was afraid, you know? And like, I kept thinking like, am I just going to talk about the same thing? But I realized like people just keep coming back because it is like, there's that emotional component and it's kind of that, underdog overcoming and like being successful and it's so inspiring to see and it's like so cool like each person has a little different obviously like what they ended up doing and I think I know for myself too when I listen to other podcasts like the ones that kind of hook me with that emotional story I listen every single week as Same. opposed to like the ones that are like five tips, you know, I might listen yeah. to a couple, but then I just scroll through the ones that'll be good for me. And then I don't listen to the rest that I do the exact same thing. And it's just a point about, you know, whatever medium you're choosing to put content out on, whether that's like podcasting or YouTube videos or blog articles or great newsletters or social yeah. content, whatever it is, um, that if pod, if podcasting has been what you have chosen to go down that path on, make it 
compelling and story based rather than so heavily tip focused. And if, however, if you are super tip focused, like I would think that YouTube would be a better fit for that, right? Like totally. people go and seek out answers yes. on YouTube. They're not going and seeking out the answer on a podcast. They're seeking stories and inspiration. And so having that mentality, if you're sitting there trying to think about like how best to put out content for your own business is an important factor to think through. Totally. And I think you can, um, I, I absolutely agree. I think YouTube is a, the how to place. Like you really are Googling how to get stuff done. And I think podcasting is more of just like storytelling and, and inspiration, but I think that you can also, uh, blend the two. I think you can tell the tips through a story. So I think you can have an interview that highlights, like I try to do, you know, a wrap up after every, every interview I do like my three takeaways. And a lot of it is the teachable points of mm -hmm. like, you know, we're, like the fear doesn't go away. You just have to, you know, or whatever, get your financial, whatever it is, like uh, get your tips. But it's through that story. Like this is what we learned from this person, you know? And I think that you can even do that in other ways of like giving an example um, of whatever tip you're trying to give. Like instead of just saying like, you know, put out this lead magnet like this, whatever, maybe you give a story of somebody who did that and, you know, increased their, email list by a thousand. It's like people just like stories. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. All of my emails are really story based. I, yeah. I love telling stories all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so, okay. So you let's go back to your story a little bit. So you, you sure. had this podcast going, uh, really building up a voice, a brand, a business. And what was your first paid offer? And like, how did that come to be? Yeah. So I, uh, just kind of dove in to the group coaching um, program. It's the only offer I've had and it's gone really well. And I, I, I did it very, not strategically. I mean, I thought about what I wanted to offer, how I could help. So what had happened is over the time, I started getting tons of emails or DMs and people wanted specific help. They wanted to know like, how do I find what I should be doing? How do I know it's the right thing? How do I, how much should I save before I quit? How do I start this business? Like, what if I feel like, I don't have any passions or whatever. And they kept, you know, I would keep it and I would respond and it would kind of go back and forth. Um, and then I just thought, well, let me try this. Let's see if I can help people. And I, you know, I could have done one-on-one, -on -one, but I figured like I could do it at a cheaper price point if I did a group. And I actually really think that there's something magical in the group setting because they can help each other. And, and a lot of times like people don't even know what to ask. So somebody asks, else will ask something about, you know, their fears. And they're like, oh yeah, I feel that way too. And it's so powerful to see that other people have your same fears, mm -hmm. not just you. And so anyways, I um, launched that in August of this last year in 2019. So I launched a beta version and I got 10 people in and we did a three month program. Of, it's called um, Stuck to Strategy. And so it's going from like feeling like a place of stuck, knowing you want to leave and not having an idea of what you want to do and coming up with a plan in three months of like what you're going to do and, and, you know, whether that's a business, whether that's changing to another career. And it was like everything I wanted and more. It was incredible. I mean, I felt my, for my own myself, you know, you never know going in, maybe you're not going to like it. And I, I just felt so energized by it. I loved being with um, all of the people. I, I, it really was such like, it was my favorite part of all of the things that I do. And so I relaunched it um, in December. We started in January. And we're actually just wrapping up the second group now. So, uh, and have you felt as excited? Oh this my god, time even around? more. Even That's more. That's amazing. It's, it gets better with each one because I think I'm obviously learning what I'm doing. Yes. And so, um, I, it's just seeing the transformations. I mean, I was we just had our last call, and I was literally crying. And then, but I was like, I can't handle. Like my heart cannot handle. Like the shift that these people have made in three months and just like what they now see as possible for them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the steps they're taking, it's just been, for me, it's like the coolest thing to watch. Such fulfilling work. Yeah. Um, so what would you say for, I'm sure this is like something that you have talked about in that group program. Um, but for anybody who's listening, who hasn't started their business yet, they're feeling stuck and they're not quite sure really what they're calling is or should be, or they're floating around with a lot of different ideas and feeling lost. I know that you have like some guidance on helping people to kind of find their calling yes. and figure that out. So what are some steps that they could be taking? 
Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. I do actually have a resource if you're interested to kind of go a little more in depth. It's called Five Steps to Finding Your Calling and you can get that at quitterclub.com slash PDF. So we'll make sure um, the link's in the show notes. Perfect, thank you. So, but just a couple of things. Um, and even that, I mean, I did it because I know like, this is just a tip with like lead magnets, like that's what people are searching. But in it, in the beginning, I, I like preface, like I hate saying like finding your calling. Like we have this thing that like you have, there's, it's like hidden under a rock somewhere. Like your passion is out there and you just have to go <laughs> like, just, you know, like it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And I think we all so often are like searching frantically for the answer. We think someone's going to give us the answer, you know? And so we're going outside of ourselves, like asking all these people or going to webinars and getting all this. And the reality is like, it is always like the answer is always within you. And I, and I know that sounds very woo woo, but here's the thing. Like we, I remember when I was quitting law, I felt like I had no other interests. Like I was like, this is the only thing I've ever done. I don't have any other passions. I don't have any other interests. And over time, once I allowed myself to like, even think of the possibility, I now have so many interests. Like I can't keep focus. I have to like write them down so that I can get back to them later because I'm like, stop getting distracted But the reality is is like, we are all curious beings by nature. And so, you know, a lot of people say this and I think it's great advice. Like don't follow your passion, follow your curiosity. Like think about the things that you are curious about. Um, A couple of tips I think is that we don't let ourselves explore or play. Like we have so much this like energy of like, I gotta figure it out, I gotta figure it out right now. And I gotta like start succeeding at it and I gotta build it and it's gotta be big. And I always liken this like as an analogy. I feel like if somebody is, you know, is single and wants to get married, if they're going into dating saying like, this first guy, it's gotta be it. Like, I don't wanna (laughs) date, I don't wanna date if we're not gonna get married. Like I want it to be, you know, and it's like, okay, but that's never gonna work. Like you have to let it just kind of organically happen. And it's the same thing. Like let yourself play, like give yourself space to try different things. Even if it has no bearing on what you're gonna do, it's unbelievable. Like when you're in a place of joy or just creativity or just a little bit of calmness, how much it opens you up to like, like gets your creative juices flowing and you start thinking, you know, I have so many people on my podcast that are like, yeah, I started volunteering at a hospital, like at a hospice center, or I started taking like a ceramics course, or I started painting. And then I realized like, I really wanted to build this nonprofit. It's not that it has anything to do with what they were doing. It's just that they gave themselves a break to breathe and not have to like frantically figure out what they wanted to do. And so I, I think that's the main, I honestly think that's the secret sauce, but because people want tactics, um, I will say that there are a lot of things you can do. Uh, one of the best ones I think is like, ask the five people closest to you, 10 people closest to you, what they think you're the best at. Because mm. so often we don't see our own strengths. Like we think it's not a big deal. Like, oh yeah, the people come to me with their problems. Like that, that's, everybody can do that. You know, I just listen, like everyone listens, but no, they don't, you know, like you're just uniquely good at that. Mm-hmm. Or so that's like a really great way of figuring out like, what, what do I love doing that comes easy to me? That's really hard for other people, you know? And you may not realize it's hard for other people. Exactly. Like you might've never realized that before. Oh my God, this happens all the time. There was, I was just listening to, um, somebody was talking about there, there's like, you know, these personality tests, there's this test. It's like a strength finder test. And it always says like, and it tells you, I, I, don't, I haven't taken it, but it's like a, a range of strengths that you can see, like 10 strengths, let's say. And then it rates you like what your strongest is, whatnot. And the girl that was talking about it was saying like, every single person gets mad about the one that like their strength that's the most because they want something else. Because we always think like the thing that's our weakness, like we should have that. Right. And then we think the thing that we, that it says is a strength for us, like that's not that big of a deal. We just right. downplay. We're just so used to it. Yeah. So we downplay whatever we have. We think we're not good, you know? And so it's so funny because that you can see that, right? Like, it's like when people tell you, you're like, that's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. It's a big deal to people and you can make a business out of it. So I would say very much focus on like what your strengths are, figure out what you like doing, ask people what they come to you for. Um, And then I have a whole bunch of lists of like how you can make these lists, how you can do these journaling prompts to kind of help uncover, like, what are the things I actually like doing? Okay. Amazing. So guys go download that freebie. Uh, we'll make sure the link is in the show notes so that you can go through that exercise. If you are in a place where you are thinking about a new business, you're thinking about launching something new, or maybe you're just wanting to pivot what you're already doing. It's not feeling aligned. Uh, it's not feeling like the, quite the right fit and you want to go down a new path. 
uh, make sure to go on, check that out. I feel the same way as you. I feel like I have a thousand ideas. Yeah. I feel like I'm always like, oh, I should, <laughs> you know, get into decorating again or like go back to doing other things or I have some newfangled business idea yeah. that my husband's always like okay Gemma like one <laughs> at a time like you've got to dial that in and chill out we're very like yin, yin and yang yeah. or whatever so like we balance each other out well same but yeah he it's, reigns me in I think I, I'm the same my husband's the same and he's always just like okay we don't have the time for that now we'll deal with that one later <laughs> But I think the reason, and I'm telling you, because I was so stuck in this other place where I really thought I had no other passion, I just think it's um, allowing yourself to believe in the possibility, mm -hmm. right? Before when, it, because what happens is you might have a split second of like, oh, that would be cool to be a decorator, an interior designer. And then immediately your critical voice comes in. is like, you have no idea what you're doing. Like, you can't do that. You're not going to start that now. You're, look how old you are. Look how, you know, we have this much debt. We have... And so you just like squash it before it even sees the light of day. And I think it's a matter of quieting that down that voice to see like, if it was possible, what would I let myself do? Like if I wasn't afraid of failing, if I wasn't afraid of what everybody was going to say, what would I give myself permission to do? And yeah. once you start kind of answering that question, there's so many things you would like to try. You just keep stopping yourself. That's right. Or if you had that mindset of, if my success is inevitable, right? Yes. Like if it's absolutely going to happen, no matter what I do, what would I do today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. This was such a good one, guys. Go grab the freebie. Where can people find you and follow you on Instagram? Give us yeah. all the scoop. Yeah. Come say hi. I love talking to anybody. DM me on Instagram at lessons from a quitter. You can really find me anywhere. The, the podcast is lessons from a quitter everywhere. The website is lessons from quitter.com. <laughs> so you can just like any, very good branding resources. Yeah. Resources uh, you need go there or just reach out to me on Instagram and I would love to connect. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you guys for listening today to this amazing interview. Uh, while you're listening, actually, if there was like a, an amazing takeaway or favorite moment or favorite tip uh, from this episode, I would love it if you would share it on Instagram. Make sure to tag myself at Gemma Bottom Carter and at Lessons from a Quitter so we can see and chat yeah. with you and share it with our audience. We would love that. So we will see you guys in the next episode of the Passive Project Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Teachery. Teachery is the online course platform we use and love in our business and absolutely recommend it to you too. Sign up for your Teachery account through our affiliate link and we will send you a free graphics pack. The graphics pack includes plug and play graphics you can use to market your online course or membership. Our affiliate link is included in the show notes along with this episode.